witnesses and those in the public gallery to make sure their mobile phones are completely turned off, please. Uh, we're here today to discuss the pre-budgetary priorities. I'd like to welcome the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Marine, Mr Michael Creed TD, and thank him for coming before the committee today to discuss priorities in advance of budgets next week. I'd also like to welcome uh, officials in the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind members that of the last hour in parliamentary practice, the effect that members should not comment on a pre-assault may charge against either a person outside the House or an official by name in such ways to make her, him or her identifiable. Uh, Minister, now I, op I invite you to make your opening statement now, please, when you're ready. Chairman, I'm just trying to put my phone on, on uh, silent, or on, my apologies. Um, Chairman, uh, and members of the uh, Joint Committee, I'm pleased to accept this invitation to meet uh, with the Committee and discuss 2019 budget priorities. I've met with many of the farm bodies and organisations, as indeed has Minister Dunahoo, to listen to the issues at the heart of the farming community. As the 2019 budgetary estimate process is not yet finalised, you can appreciate that I am not in a position to discuss the finer details of my department's proposals. However, I will focus on expenditure so far in 2018 and the coming months and the challenges I see ahead for 2019. It is important to note that the, the ongoing vital contribution that the agri-food sector makes to the Irish economy, particularly the rural economy, as well as the important role the international trading environment plays in sustaining this contribution. It is clear that the biggest challenge comes in the form of Brexit. The sector employs 173,000 people, including those involved in primary production and processing and the food and beverages sector, which is a total of almost 8% of total employment in 2017. One of the unique strengths the agri-food sector has is our shared vision for the sustainable develop development of the sector in Foodwise 2025. Having direct input from all stakeholders in the agri-food supply chain, along with the department and state agencies in strategy formation and implementation, is crucial. In terms of responding to the significant challenges we face as a sector, from Brexit to climate change to geopolitical developments outside of our control, doubling down on the key food-wise themes of market development, competitiveness, innovation, human capital, capital and environmental sustainability is more important than ever. Brexit poses enormous challenges for the agri-food and fishery sectors by virtue of their exposure to the UK market. The United Kingdom is Ireland's largest export market for agri-food products, 5.2 billion in 2017, while Ireland is the United Kingdom's largest export market, 4.1 billion euros of imports in 2017. The most immediate impact of Brexit has been the difficulties caused by the significant drop in the value of sterling against the euro. Possible long-term impacts relate to the potential need to conduct import controls on animal, animals, plants and products of animal and plant origin imported from the United Kingdom, the certification of Irish agri-food exports to the United Kingdom and the possibility of a hard Brexit resulting in tariffs on trade. The challenge has been to take effective steps to mitigate the immediate, immediate impacts and to intensify market diversification efforts in order to reduce our exposure to the United Kingdom market. These challenges are being addressed through budgetary measures covering building competitiveness and resilience on and off farm and through market diversification and development. Brexit preparation is complicated by uncertainty surrounding the current negotiations and the potential final trading relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom. Nevertheless, my department's Brexit planning, guided by recent government decisions, is well advanced. Officials have been working with other departments and agencies to ensure that they are prepared to fulfil their legal obligations as efficiently as possible when the United Kingdom exits the European Union. I am pleased that significant progress has been made in the development of a long-term investment loan scheme for Irish SMEs, including farmers. This scheme has been developed by my department in cooperation with the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation, the Department of Finance, the European Investment Fund and the Strategic Banking Corporation of Ireland. By its nature, the detail of this scheme has taken time to develop and negotiate between all the parties involved. The scheme will be of particular benefit to the Irish agri-food sector, including farmers, the seafood sector and agri-food businesses. It will enable them to invest in their businesses and to innovate for future growth. This is a key Brexit response for which I made financial provision in Budget 2018. This will bring longer term, in the region of 8 to 10 year, unsecured investment finance to the Irish market with interest rates typically less than 5%. This type of product, long-term unsecured investment finance, is not currently available for many farmers and food businesses and the seafood sector. This has been identified as a critical need. 
The loan scheme will be of particular benefit to young and new entrant farmers and smaller scale farmers who typically have less bargaining power with their banking institutions. In terms of efforts towards market diversification, Foodwise 2025 outlines the huge potential for growth in agri-food exports to new and emerging markets, particularly in Asia and Africa. My department will continue to seek out and identify new markets, and I'm ready to respond to other opportunities that may arise. In keeping with Foodwise 2025 priorities, I led a successful trade mission to the United States and Canada in February 2018, while in May I led a trade mission to China. For the remainder of 2018, I will lead a trade mission to Indonesia and Malaysia at the end of October. Minister Doyle intends to travel to China in November. These and other missions being planned for 2019 will serve to enhance and improve existing levels of market access in these destinations. It will also promote Ireland's reputation as a producer of high-quality, safe and sustainably produced meat and dairy products. The destinations are in keeping with the market prioritisation exercise completed by Borbia in December 2017 at my request. Borbia's resources have been increased significantly over, re over recent years, together with increased focus by my department's market access team on opening new markets, particularly for meat exports. In terms of product diversification, I'm pleased to note that the funding provided for the prepared consumer food centre in Ashtown is making good progress. This is to address the situation where traditionally investment in R&D within the sector has been low across the industry, given that 76% of the prepared consumer food companies in Ireland are small. The €5 million Euros being used for the purchase of specialist processing and packaging equipment which companies can pilot with a view to scaling up their production and or their operations. Overall, in 2018, the Exchequer contribution to the vote of my department amounts to €1.557 billion. Euros. Our expenditure, expenditure to date is £977 million. This is £113 million ahead of the same time last year. We are now entering year four of our seven-year rural development scheme, and many of our schemes are reaching peak payment rates. Earlier this year, I presented a review of our RDP expenditure to this committee. As I stated then, projections are that the 2014 to 2020 RDP will not just be fully spent, but will require €105 million Euros of transitional funding from the next programme, additional to the €4 billion provided for if implementation continues at current levels. Delivering on the Rural Development Programme is challenging, and I am delighted to say that Ireland is performing very well. Ireland leads in terms of implementation and has the second highest rate of drawdown of the European Union funds among member states. The allocated budget for 2018 for the RDP is £625 million, and I expect this to be fully spent. This includes the increased allocation of £25 million to the areas of natural constraint scheme announced in Budget 2018, £186 million issued for 2018 ANC payments in September, an increase of £23 million compared to this time last year, so the vast majority of additional allocation is already distributed. Some 19,000 farmers continue to participate in the sheep welfare scheme in year two. Advance, advance payments are due to commence in November 2018, and it is estimated that expenditure in 2018 will total some 18 million euros. I will make full provision in the estimates for our commitments to participate under RDP, RDP schemes in 2019. 2018 has proved an exceptionally difficult year in terms of weather, with storms earlier early this year turning to drought conditions with consequent implications for fodder availability. In supporting farmers through this time, I implemented a number of measures, allocating funding to support the importation of up to 85,000 tonnes of fodder and 2.75 million towards incentivising the production of fodder on up to 25,000 hectares of arable lands that would normally lie fallow over the winter period. These measures, coupled with additional flexibilities for later application of fertiliser granted under the nitrates regulations and additional flexibilities under glass, are maximising fodder availability. Whilst many farmers remain in deficit, these measures have resulted in improving the fodder situation across the country. The seafood industry faces ongoing challenges, including the significant Brexit challenge. In 2018, by providing world-class landing facilities for our industry, such as the Department's investment for a major key extension in Castledown Bear, which will double landing facilities on Danish Island, we are protecting our coastal communities. Together with a range of investments in products and, market funder, and markets funded under the EMFF Seafood Development Programme, we are creating the opportunity for the seafood industry to continue to grow and prosper. I recognise that such support has never been more important given the particular challenges now faced by the sector. The CAP post-2020 reform pre presents a different set of challenges. 
It comes against the backdrop of Brexit and other newer European Union priorities such as security and migration and the global challenges of climate change. The European Commission's proposals involve new ambition in terms of the environment and climate change and increased emphasis on knowledge transfer, technology adoption and competitiveness, new incentives for young farmers, all while maintaining vital supports for, for farm income. The budgetary allocation for the 2021-2027 period will be a critical determinant of how those challenges can be met. I have been working hard with my European colleagues to get agreement on the restoration of the CAP budget to current levels in the next period. This effort has paid dividends. Up to 20 member states have joined this alliance and we will continue to work together to build consensus on this point. As we go into another reform, I will continue to work with my colleagues in Europe to ensure the best possible deal is secured for farmers, the agricultural sector and the rural economy as a whole. As mentioned earlier, I am conscious that this has been a difficult year for the beef sector in terms of weather and the range of challenges associated with it. My department is continuing to examine appropriate measures to support all agri-food sectors, including the suckler sector. This is a particular focus in relation to our policy negotiation objectives in the next CAP reform, and we will be informed by stakeholder consultation on the needs of the sector. But I do want to make this important point. As a community, we in Ireland have to embrace the challenge of addressing climate change and other environmental imperatives. Agriculture will have to make its contribution, and it is clear that any new cap must be configured to help us to do that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Minister. First up is Deputy McConnell. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And thanks to the Minister and to his officials for coming in today to discuss uh, key issues in advance of the budget. And um, I take up on one of your, your final points, Minister, and that's in relation to the need for additional support to our beef sector, and in particular the suckler cow sector. And I know this is an issue we've discussed uh, on many occasions in the Dáil, um, and uh, I've raised and, and pressed with you uh, as something which needs to be prioritised. And uh, as you will well know, Minister, from the ploughing championships, um, it is an issue that is being um, prioritised by farming organisations as well, and indeed the IFA have uh, conducted a, a report and research in relation to the suckler cow sector and the benefit of any additional support that would go to it. But it's not sufficient, Minister, to say that I mean that's simply a matter for the next CAP programme. Um, as you'll be well aware, the beef sector is under massive pressure as things stand, and many farmers are considering their future uh, uh, as we speak in the suckler sector and are looking to yourself and looking to the government for an indication at the absolute minimum and for movement uh, towards the introduction of uh, a €200 Euro per cow suckler cow payment, but at least progress in relation to it in this budget. Um, I think we have to get to the stage where that is, is in place. Uh, we can absolutely discuss uh, the format uh, and how that uh, is, is, is uh, introduced. But, Minister, I think there is an opportunity for you now in this budget to do something uh, which will give an indication to the beef and the suckler cow sector that uh, you as Minister understands the very precarious situation that they are in. And I think that requires, Minister, movement from you in relation to additional funding towards the suckler cow sector. And I would hope, Minister, that next week um, that we will see something in relation to that. Um, and uh, I think that your stance so far that it is something which you wouldn't consider, and at the very minimum, which you, 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 you the, the most you, the farthest you've gone is that it is something, and that's only belatedly that you would consider as part of the next cap. Um, that simply um, doesn't doesn't wash, Minister, or isn't sufficient. We, we, we farmers do need to see something um, happen, and, and indeed happen in this particular budget. Um, another key issue and priority, and you did address it in your, your uh, clearly in your comments, is in relation to the fodder crisis that is imminent, and in particular the need for short-term support in the format of uh, low-interest loans, a low-interest loan scheme for, uh, to assist farmers with the pressure many are under after the drought that we experienced this past uh, summer in relation to merchant debt and short-term credit. And, uh, Minister, that is something, again, the farming organisations have been very clear in um, seeking, seeking um, assistance from the government in relation to that matter, and in specifically looking for uh, a loan scheme under the auspices of the SPCI to assist farmers um, with the, the, the credit pressure that they're under. And, uh, again, Minister, it's something that needs to be addressed in the current budget. And, unfortunately, I mean, we can't 
uh, and it's simply unacceptable what we've seen in relation to your lack of delivery in relation to the Brexit loan scheme, um, given that uh, it is almost a year now since the funding allocation was provided for that, and we still, at this point in time, don't have the scheme in place. Um, in relation to uh, the, 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 the winter ahead as well, Minister, I think it is going to be important that there is a hardship um, a hardship scheme uh, and allocation in relation to farmers that may find themselves in a very difficult position as the winter goes on. We hope that that won't come to pass, but it's important the provision is made in relation to that. Um, in, in relation to an, another key objective, Minister, and I'd ask you to, your, for your feedback in relation to it, and it's not the first budget in which this has been presented in your table, and that's the Fire Management Deposit Scheme um, an income, as an additional income volatility tool to actually uh, provide additional assist, assistance and capacity to farmers because of the volatility of the sector um, to be able to manage their income and to plan ahead uh, and be in a position to actually uh, uh, buffer against the types of years that we have seen and, and pressures that we have seen in this particular year, for example. Um, and uh, also, Minister, in relation to um, the uh, one issue which we have discussed at this um, committee on a couple of occasions, I will just issue, discuss, bring up briefly, and you might come in as well, and that is the, the issue of harness racing. Um, the committee has been in correspondence with you in relation to it, and seed capital in relation to supporting uh, that, that to get up off the ground, um, and whether there will be some allocation made in the budget for that. Um, and uh, also, Minister, and, and finally, in relation to the um, in relation to the, the, the current price, and I think it's, it's, it's important we raise this with you today, the current price of uh, beef and the difficulty the farmers are experiencing there. Um, I know you have the Beef Fair Forum coming up um, this week. Uh, I think it's February was the last occasion in which it met. I think it, it has failed the farming sector and the beef sector so far, uh, Minister. And uh, we've seen a situation over recent weeks where the price of beef in the UK, for example, has been increasing when uh, particular pressure has been put on the, by the factories on the beef price here. And uh, with the budget at hand, Minister, in particular with the Beef Forum this week, um, I think this is an opportunity, a particular opportune uh, uh, time for you today to address the unacceptable situation where we're seeing prices being squeezed, and in particular, Minister, I would urge you to ensure that at the forum this week you make it crystal clear to the factories that a fair price must be delivered to farmers and the pressures which they have experienced in terms of weather this year and uh, the fact that many may have to sell additional uh, stock, that that does not be used to further, uh, further cut margins and leave them in an even more difficult situation that they might than they otherwise face. And, uh, as well, Minister, just and very finally, Chair, in relation to the Brexit, um, which, uh, the potential for a hard Brexit which we are facing into this March. Um, and I know we're discussing the budget here, but were that to be a hard Brexit minister, it would be uh, an earthquake shock to our agriculture sector. Um, and it's absolutely critical that you put in provision in this year's budget to be able to uh, prepare for that and be in the position to assist the agriculture sector and be fully prepared to, to mitigate against the challenges that that presents. And uh, I hope that you can give us some clarification today and update in relation to the support that uh, you, you, you plan to make and also uh, that there will be uh, provision in the budget with, in that regard as well. Next, Deputy Kenny, please. Uh, thank you very much, Minister and staff, for coming into us. Uh, I, I'll start probably in the same place. I, I attended a, a very large meeting last night in uh, Balnaslow around the issue of the Suckler Cow, and there was about 4,500 farmers present, and they were um, all feeling huge pressure because of the beef sector and uh, its impact back onto the, 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 the Suckler Cow sector. And you know, they're, they're under a real crisis here. And I pointed out last night that it's, it's four years ago since I remember those protests at supermarkets and at meat factories around the country about what was going on and the pressure that farmers are under. And four years on, we've had uh, the, the beef forum. And really, Minister, it hasn't worked. You know, it, it, has been, it has been somewhat of a failure because we're still in the same position. And I think um, the demand that's been put out there for farmers is that 
the government needs to come in and, 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 and ensure that farmers get fair play, first of all, in regard to price, but also that there needs to be a package put in place for to support the suckler cow sector, because it, it really needs that to ensure that it will have a future, and to, I suppose, show that, that government is prepared to invest in it and understands the plight of farmers, mainly in, and, and the map was put up on the wall yesterday evening, mainly in, down the western seaboard and the border region. That's mainly where most of the suckler cows are. And 80 per cent of, this, of the stock in that part of the world are suckler cows, and, and, and they really need to get, to get a lift in respect of that. And I would uh, be interested to hear your comments in regard to that. Uh, I know there has been talk of €200 Euro per suckler cow. Maybe it may fall somewhere short of that, but at least we need to see some provision being put into the budget in regard to that. Um, in addition, uh, the, 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 the other issues I'd like to, to raise with you, Minister, is in regard to where we are, and I'll, I'll go back to where you started yourself in regard to, to Brexit and what's it's, what it's going to do and the, the, the impact of that. And we spoke earlier in the, in the committee around you know, the whole issue of Brexit and the impact it's going to have on small food producers. And I, I just wonder, the Foodwise 2025, in regard to that, I, I personally have, a, have an issue there. I feel that there is too much emphasis on volume and not enough emphasis on value. I think we've seen that from the there was a presentation made last night from Joe Burke from from Borbia, and he pointed out that the prices that that we're getting for our beef across the world scale is pretty much average, and, and I think that's that's an issue, and we need to face that issue, and we need to be looking at value and how we can get a higher price and ensure that that price is returned to the farmer. Um, the, the other issues there in regard to the, the budget, Minister, I just wonder, the, the, the young farmers, and the, that issue has something that has been talked about for quite a length of time as to what we can do in regard to delivering for that small sector of farmers that want to get into the industry, that feel that they are locked out, that can't get entitlements, that can't get any break, and will there be something in the budget to deliver for them? Uh, also in regard to the, the areas of natural constraint, uh, last year there was additional money put into that. It's very welcome. Will there be an additional piece of money put into it again this year? Because it's, it's actually needed. It's, it's, it's the parts, I, I know you're smiling, but it's the, it's the, it's the sector of farming where, where the most pressure is. It's the land that's least productive, but at the same time it does produce uh, a huge benefit for the farmers that work on that land, and many of them feel that they're being squeezed out. Um, there's approximately, I, I see in your opening statement here, approximately 19,000 farmers participating in the sheep welfare scheme. And I know there's pressure for to, to go down the route of, of using the, the, the new tags, the uh, digital tags. And I, I just wonder, is there, is there a possibility of increasing that payment for to, for to cover that? Uh, I know we're, we're certainly of the view that there should be an increase of five euro per, uh, per yo for that, and that it would at least uh, give that sector again an additional help in regard to that. Also in regard to the, um, uh, the issue of the, the, the cheap loans, which we're told we're going to be going to try and get more of them. Um, for many farmers out there, the problem they've got is, is almost beyond loans at this stage, because they, they feel like they wouldn't, if they'd got the loans, they wouldn't have the capacity to pay them back. And that's why the issue around the ANC, around the sheep welfare scheme and around the suckler cow scheme are vital for to try and put money into the hands of these farmers that, that really need them at this point in time. Um, the, the state aid rules around support for government coming in, particularly in, in Brexit, uh, is something that I think could have a huge, a huge problem for us into the future, because clearly if we do have a hard Brexit, we're going to have a lot of food companies in this country who export mainly to Britain who are going to be left in a serious situation. The only hope they have of surviving and not shedding jobs, which is what we don't want them to do, is for the, the state to come in and assist them. But if we do that, we're going to be in breach of state aid rules. And I wonder, in respect of that, has there been negotiations with uh, the European Commission to ensure that we can get a buy-ball in regard to that? Because we really need one if we're going to try and sustain the industry in the future. Um, the, the other issue, and it was actually brought up earlier on, and you mentioned about the seafood industry and in regard to the whole issue of, of aquaculture and uh, the salmon farming sector, uh, the delays, and I know the committee will be writing to you about this again, but the, the delays that there is in that sector in, in getting salmon farm licences is, is something that is, is, is really strangling that whole sector. And uh, we really need to, to see that there is going to be 
it's, it's not really an issue of investment, it's actually an issue of the Department stepping up to the mark and recognising that it is an industry that has potential and delivering for it. Uh, I leave it for that with that. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thanks, uh, Deputy. Um, Deputy Cahill next, and then second of Deputy Cahill, back to the Minister. Yeah, um, thank you, Chairman, and um, thanks to uh, the Minister and his, and his officials for the presentation today. Um, you know, the whole farmers and the food sector are looking to this budget um, next week to see, you know, what, what the government's commitment is to the, to, to the whole industry. Um, I suppose 2018 has been an extremely difficult year. Um, farmers are under extreme financial pressure. We had, I suppose, one of the worst springs, one of the longest winters and a non-existent spring. And then we had the problems with, a, with an extremely dry summer. And, you know, the income, the income level out there is, is at zero in a lot of enterprises. And there's huge merchant debt been, has built up over the winter and this summer. And cows have been fed this summer the same as they would be fed in the month of January and February. And there is huge bills out there. And facing into a winter now where there's inadequate fodder as we face into the winter and the cost of fodder has spiralled and the cost of concentrate feeding is, is spiralling as well. And, you know, we're, I suppose, just in the first days of October, but grass growth has stopped very, very fast and has slowed down very significantly. And, you know, that is, you know, sending shivers up farmer spines. It looks like, you know, uh, feeding will have to commence at, at full winter rate very, very, very quickly. I suppose, Minister, it's very disappointing to be talking about, you know, the 2019 budget when, you know, commitments that were given for the budget of 2018 still haven't been delivered on. And I refer specifically um, to, the, to the, Brexit, the low interest Brexit loans. And to be still waiting for them 12 months later is disappointing in the extreme. And <coughs> low cost loans uh, are essential in to be announced in this budget. I remember in the budget of 2016, when you announced, announced the low cost, in, uh, low cost interest loans, I said at the door that you know, there wasn't enough money allocated to this and it wouldn't be adequate to cater for the man that was there. The bent up frustration for credit out there at the moment with farmers is huge. And seeing in your document there talking about an interest rate of 5%, um, that's not a low cost loan, Minister. And you know, the Bank of Ireland, you know, were in were in with us there a couple of weeks ago and they have a, a, a loan scheme which is significantly lower than that. But the problem with the banks is that a lot of those farmers who are most in need of it won't get access won't get access to their loans. And it happened last time round where the farmers who were in the most financial pressure didn't get access to the low cost loans. And you know, farmers who you know changed um, changed probably lo different loans they had into the low into low cost loans were probably some of the greatest beneficiaries. So I think you know first of all we, we have to have a low cost loans in the, in next week's budget. But I think we'll have to Tagus will have to have a role to play or some other government agency to ensure that those farmers who are most in need of this low cost loans get adequate access to it. And I think you know that is absolutely essential. On the beef sector, like the other two speakers before me have talked, I think our beef sector now is at a critical crossroads. And men are making decisions as regards to their future. And they're waiting until after the budget next week to decide whether they'll exit the industry or not. And, you know, we've seen factories this, this, this summer exploiting the situation and cutting prices without justification to farmers. And that has, that has implications the whole way back down the pricing structure, back down to the price of the calf. I think, you know, the forum, the beef forum, has got to be used to, to, to put, bring transparency to the industry and to show us exactly what a side of beef is worth. And, you know, it is, it is uh, very disappointing to see the price of, of steers at the moment at the price of what um, cold cows were a couple of months ago. And um, it shows with the price of beef rising in the UK and our factories um, dropping prices week on week, it's just, it, it, it's just sending, um, you know, it's, 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 it's completely unjustified. And I think the lack of live exports at the moment um, is, is playing a huge part in, in the factory's ability to, to, to exploit the situation. And I think live exports and funding to Borbia to have more live exports um, is absolutely essential. And the, 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 the closure of the, of, the, of, of, the, of, the Tur of the Turkish market at the moment is definitely a factor there. But I think extra resources have to be put into Borbia. 
And, you know, you talked there about market diversification. And, uh, you know, while I won't disagree with that sentiment, in reality, over a 12-month period, how practical is that? We have Brexit coming fast down the tracks at us. And like, if we go back and examine, you know, how, how, how over the last decade, how we've re um, dependency in the UK market was always a focus of board B to reduce that dependency. You're only talking about percentage points over a long number of years of the, of the reduction in, de in dependency. And we have other products, um, specifically cheddar, cheddar cheese, which, you know, virtually its only home is the UK. So, you know, diversification, while we have to try and pursue it, definitely isn't going to solve all our issues. But next week, Minister, low-cost loans, you know, a, lo uh, a movement towards a €200 Euro payment for suckler cows, um, the sheep sector, and particularly Helios, they all have to see um, um, some recognition in next, week's, in, in next week's budget to try and restore some kind of a profitability to the sector. Also, ANC payments need to be increased further to bring them back to, 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 where, to, where, to where they were being originally. And, you know, I don't want, you know, we don't want to talk about, you know, they were cut by, by Fianna Fáil nine, ten years ago. We are where we are now. We have a different economic situation now than we had then. And I think um, ANC payments need, need, to be need to be restored. On the, you know, the taxation front, we, I think the thresholds for inheritance and transfer of family farms, um, those need to be increased. Agricultural relief has to be maintained at its present level. And the taxation incentives that are there, whether it be stock relief or you know, stamp duty exemptions for young farmers, they are all absolutely essential to be kept in place. But, Minister, I can't stress enough how important um, this week's next, next budget is. Farmers, you know, are looking to the budget to see is there a serious commitment to our sector. And, you know, men are making decisions. And, you know, I've met men over the last couple of months who would never before think of, of ceasing the farming enterprises that they're involved in. But they, that discussion is going on, and they feel that, you know, there's not some commitment to their sector, uh, you know, that they will move away. I'd also like to just reflect on the pig sector, which, you know, I suppose has a small number of farmers involved, but again a sector which is under huge pressure and will need low-cost loans to survive as well. They're caught in, I suppose, a perfect storm with, um, you know, a severe drop in pig prices and their, their inputs on the other side increasing dramatically. And, you know, that's a, select, a sector which, I suppose, doesn't get much media attention, but is absolutely under huge pressure and is an important industry for the country. So, Minister, I think next week, um, you know, the rural Ireland will be looking very anxiously next week to see that there is a commitment to the different sectors and that there is a commitment to um, try and keep profitable farming in place. And, you know, whether it is from the dairy side, the beef side, um, gra grain, pigs, all sectors are under huge financial pressure. And um, it's, um, next week's budget is, is uh, hugely important. Step, but David, the Minister, I think there's about 15 or 16 different topics there that yeah. I get you to address now at this stage. Okay, Minister, I, the, the, there are, but I think there's a, there's a degree of commonality as well, and I'll try and deal with them all, uh, Chairman. Um, I, I want to take the issue first of, 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 of the access to, to credit, and, 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 and uh, because it's been raised, I think, by all, all three speakers. This is not an issue that's, that's a core activity of the Department of Agriculture, but I think it has to be acknowledged that uh, our initial foray into this was because we recognised that the banking system wasn't functioning as it should in terms of access to working capital uh, for the farming community. And there are many studies, uh, in, including, if I recall rightly, the central bank, if it was, I think it was quarter two report of 2016, did a review of access, the cost of credit across the EU uh, member states, uh, or the, the Euro member states, and found that we were certainly, you know, in terms of the league table of price uh, or cost of credit, uh, we were, we were uh, rooted in the relegation zone. Uh, so we, we made our initial foray into the area of working capital and 150 million euros at 2.95 per cent. The product was a success. Um, 4,249, I think, were the number of farmers that benefited. Um, and I take the point that Deputy Cal says, you know, there were many who didn't. 
But bear in mind, in the context of kind of the global, uh, you know, 130,000 farmers odd, it, it, it's, it's a relatively small number of beneficiaries given the overall numbers. Uh, but I, I think the benefit of it was far greater than just those who, who actually drew down loans. What it actually did, and the proof is there, is that it generated competition in the market for other products and, and, and uh, other financial institutions to respond. Um, and I think the evidence is there now that in the, in the area of similar products uh, for working capital, the market has responded. And I saw, I mean, um, there's a number of initiatives from, from all of the pillar banks that were involved in the, in the um, delivering the 150 million euro loan scheme. I saw one of the products recently in terms of the cost of three-year money for 30,000 was at a rate that was virtually similar to what we had put out in terms of the, of the uh, 150 million euro loan scheme. So the question then is, like, is it uh, beneficial to put another tranche of taxpayers' money into developing a product that's already in the marketplace by the, the, the financial institutions, or is there another area of activity where there is a, a need for greater competition? And I, I do acknowledge that in the context of last year's budget, there, there was a, you know, a, a demand in respect of both. But I think it, you know, in, in the context of the 25 million that we, we secured in last year's budget uh, for this purpose, we take the view, because of the competition that has been stimulated in the area of working capital, that the, the appropriate response now to build resilience in, in the industry and in primary producers in particular is in the area of access to affordable capital for, um, capi for, uh, for investment purposes rather than for working capital. Um, now, I accept you know, that there is uh, concern in that space, uh, some would like both. Uh, some dispute the fact that, you know, that there is sufficient competition, but I think all of the indications are whether it's pillar banks, merch uh, merchant credit delivered through the co-ops themselves, uh, credit unions active in that space, there is a lot more competition in that space now. And relatively speaking, the bigger uh, return for investment in that space now is in the area of supporting affordable finance for capital investment. Now, we got 25 million and we are working with a number of strategic partners to deliver a product in the area of invest, capital investment and I've outlined uh, the detail of that. Uh, as in unsecured borrowing, and it's important that we compare like with like, we're talking about unsecured borrowing over a period of eight to 10 years, both of which are not available currently at a competitive rate. And what we are envisaging in the context of those two parameters to have a product that would be available at less than 5%. Now that is not in the marketplace at the moment, and particularly if you are a young farmer or a new uh, business, uh, food business, that, that availability of unsecured borrowing uh, is not available. And uh, the unsecured would be up to 500,000, I think, is the, is, is the cap, and a minimum borrowing of 50,000. The, that's the parameters of the new product that we would develop. Now, we d people say, why isn't the product in the marketplace already? Well, we, we delivered earlier in this year, through SBCI as well, a 300 million euro working capital fund for the SME sector, of which 40% was, was ring-fenced for the uh, primary, uh, for the agri-food business. So it wasn't until we got that product out into the market that we were ready to engage with SBCI and a number of other partners, including the European Investment Fund, to deliver the current product. So um, I accept that in the context of the announcement last year, um, you know, here we are, the money we, we've secured will be paid over in terms of securing the, the availability of the fund, but the product won't be in the market at, for drawdown until the start of the year. But, you know, the, the detail of it are available now, and we will work with, with uh, the remaining steps that need to be taken to deliver it uh, to marketplace. And I think in terms of the sequence of events, the 150 million didn't get into 300 million out, which uh, went, uh, was launched in March this year. Uh, and, and then beginning the engagement with SBCI, European Investment Fund, Finance, Enterprise, uh, my own department. Um, there are so many moving parts in, in, in this latter scheme that we don't control all the levers on it. Um, if we did, we probably would have, would have a product in, in the marketplace already, but we're dealing with a number of partners, including SBCI, European Investment Fund, etc. So we will have that mark product. It will be different. It's not a repetition of the previous one because 
competition has been leveraged by virtue of the previous initiative we took in that space. Um, Chairman, the other one which has uh, been raised by everybody is the beef sector and the suckler sector. And, and I do acknowledge um, that you know, there is, there is a, a very challenging uh, scenario out there and it has been tied into the beef forum and beef prices, etc. Um, the beef forum is, is, I think, a very useful creation to enable engagement between all of the stakeholders on the range of issues. And I will raise, I will raise personally with, with the, the processors the obligation to recognise that this is a symbiotic relationship between beef farmers and the processing sector. It is not a forum where prices can be fixed. That's clearly understood, I think, and acknowledged by all of the farm organisations. Um, but I want to see a situation where primary producers get a fair return for their produce. And the forum is an opportunity to engage on a range of issues. I mean, one of the initiatives that we have put forward in the context of the beef sector uh, and provided funding through the RDP, and which is on the agenda for discussion tomorrow, I mean, we had, you know, calls you know, over the last several weeks to convene the Beef Forum, uh, and we have done so. And one of the items on the agenda tomorrow is how to progress the producer organisation uh, for which we have provided funding. It's not a panacea, as I've said, uh, for, for all the deals, but it does work in other commodity areas, it works in other jurisdictions in terms of the beef industry, and I think there is potential to, for it to deliver uh, greater clout uh, in terms of the engagement with the processing sector than an individual farmer has. And um, that's something that, that I will explore uh, with uh, the forum uh, when it meets uh, tomorrow. I mean, on the issue of live exports, Deputy Cal raised in the context of the beef industry, our, our numbers are running significantly. I mean, if you take uh, 2017 was up, uh, I think, about 30% on 2016 figures, and uh, likewise, 2018 figures are up about 30% on 2017 figures, significantly in terms of the beef industry. Uh, I think in 2018, primarily in the, in the, in the spring and early summer, about 147,000 calves were exported. Um, that's, that's a very significant issue. You did raise, in particular, one uh, uh, area of live exports, and that is the Turkish market. And obviously, because of devaluation of the, the, the uh, currency in Turkey, a consequence of geopolitical events outside of our control, um, the, the, that market is in, in, in some difficulty for us now. And we are you know, always looking for new market opportunities, whether it is to EU countries or uh, for winnings like Spain, uh, some of which find a, a migratory route from Spain into North Africa or ourselves directly to North Africa, particularly to Libya. I met recently with an Egyptian delegation that were over. We're active in exploring all of those opportunities. And I personally, um, absolutely committed to live exports as an important uh, outlet for competition in the marketplace and will remain extremely active in that space. And I've met uh, with all of the live exporters in roundtable fashion in the department uh, to emphasise the importance of the sector uh, to, the, to the beef industry and their uh, continued participation and, and activity in that space is, is, is really, really important. Um, Board via funding. Uh, look at the trajectory, look at the staff complement. I mean, it, it's gone in the right direction. It's, it's challenged uh, not just in the area of beef, but also in the whole other commodity areas because of Brexit, but very significant increase in their funding, very significant increase in their staff recruitment. Um, and indeed, not all of the, the judgment should, should be on the numbers of additional staff, though I understand they're in the region of Turkey additional staff uh, recruited. But there are also uh, contract staff on the ground that are being used uh, to, to deliver assistance to, to so um, there is a lot of activity in that area and um, you know I, I am acutely aware of the issues around uh, the soccer cow enterprise in particular I, I I do feel we need to be measured and I accept that there's a challenge in in the soccer cow sector and I am absolutely committed to ensuring that it remains you know, a, a key producer of high quality beef uh, in the country because of all of the associated benefits from that, but um, in terms of, of uh, export earnings, etc. And the primary objective is to make sure that we get a fair return for the, the primary producer. 
But we can overstate uh, the, 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 the extent to which there is a flight from, from uh, suckler cows as well. And I think it's important that we don't do that. There is an issue which needs to be addressed. There are different fora that need to, <coughs> need to address it in, uh, both in the context of domestic and CAP uh, policy, uh, and I'm aware of that. But the, there was always an expectation in the context of dairy quotas going that there would be a rebalancing. In fact, that hasn't happened to the extent that many experts predicted it would. The demise or, or, or reduction in the herd is, I think, about 7% since the, the, uh, um, the area quotas went. And it's most pronounced, in fact, in the areas where there was a direct migration across to, to, to dairy enterprises. I think the biggest reductions were in Carlow, Kilkenny, Watford and Cork. Uh, some people moving entirely across the dairy and some people eliminating a, da a beef enterprise and moving on their holding to a fully uh, dairy uh, sector. So the, the, the reduction is not as great as as being suggested, and uh, we need to do everything we can in the context of the policy instruments uh, available, including CAP, which is where the biggest level of supports currently come from, uh, to, to ensure that those that are in the sector uh, can uh, see a future for them. We have, for example, delivered, and many of the beef farmers are beneficiaries of this, in ANC payments. We put an additional 25 million in this year into ANC payments, and we focused it on those who operate on the most marginal land. So some of you ref referred to kind of the, the, the prevalence of this enterprise in the Western Seaboard in particular. And a lot of that land was the beneficiary of the focused approach we took uh, in the department in, in respect of the additional 25 million uh, euros. Um, the issue of um, uh, Food-wise, uh, uh, Deputy Kinney, and you, you said that there was uh, an overemphasis on volume rather than value. In fact, there is no volume target in Food-wise 2025 at all. The, the ambition is to grow the value uh, of our exports to 19 billion euros by 2025. There is no volume target for any specific commodity. Um, so. What, what Foodwise does, in essence, is like it identifies across all the commodity areas what are the impediments that are there, the roadblocks that are there, and the function then of, of, of all of the stakeholders is together to try and address each and every one of those uh, roadblocks, and then enable the industry, dairy, uh, pork, sheep meat, beef, tillage, uh, to, to respond then to the opportunities that clearing those roadblocks presents. But there isn't a volume target set in respect to beef or a volume target set in respect to dairy. There is a value target. And as we seek to develop products that go up the higher up the value added chain, it will be value rather than volume will, will drive uh, the returns for us. But what we are doing is, is addressing the roadblocks and then along the industry to respond. And, and you know, within that framework, people have said because of Brexit or because of climate change and all that, we should you know, rein in our ambition. I, I, th I think on the contrary, I think it was never more important to have a blueprint that kind of says uh, this is our stated ambition and these are the things that are stopping us of achieving that ambition. Forget the, 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 the 19 billion or the 23,000 jobs, that's what may be achieved. Let's focus on all the things that are there that are an impediment. Um, and whether that's in, in human capital or sustainability or all of the other pillars of, of food wise, I think they are all things that we should be active around and, 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 and try and address. So there is no, volu there is no uh, volume targets in any specific area, um, but there are uh, ambitions um, for employment and, and, and for the value of, of the outcome and, uh, and, and produce and exports. You mentioned um, EID. Um, I don't think I've had the opportunity to, to discuss this issue in the, in, in the committee previously, but I mean, I don't think anybody would defend the existing uh, system as fit for purpose, but in many ways, uh, whether we felt obliged to defend it or not, the game changer in respect of EID was when the uh, Food Safety Authority said that our current traceability system wasn't fit for purpose. And having received that report, uh, do nothing was not an option. So we, we decided that we would address it and the best available technology undoubtedly is in elect electronic identification. And I believe we have responded uh, to the concerns of the industry substantially in terms of the dates, 
in terms of the uh, cost, etc., uh, to farmers. I've always acknowledged that there is a cost, but there is also uh, a cost associated with the risk of doing nothing. Now, I don't think it was ever an option not to respond to the food safety report, which effectively said, because we didn't have traceability, that could become an issue for, of public health. Um, but it would also, uh, if, if we had an issue under our current regime uh, of not being able to recall product, uh, that in itself could have consequences in the marketplace and for our reputation. So we, we, we moved, and I think we have reached a situation where I, I mean, no, no party, whether it is processors or marts or farmers, are entirely happy about it, but I mean, there is an obligation on all of the, 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 the stakeholders there to respond uh, to the issue, and I think we've found a reasonable uh, response in, in, in all of that. And we have, as I said, moved on the level of support we're paying to farmers, uh, with a maximum of the €100, Euros, um, and financial assistance also available to marts, for example, as uh, central points of recording of data, etc. So uh, I think we've, we've, we have made a reasonable effort in the, in, in the context of an issue where we had no choice but to uh, proceed as, as we did. And I do believe, uh, for the record, that EID Though now being introduced in, in, in the sheep sector, uh, and you know that is only doing what, what other juris neighbouring jurisdictions have already done. It is inevitable, because it's the best available technology, that it will become the the identification process of uh, for, for the uh, bovine sector as well. And relatively speaking, of course, in the context of a bovine carcass as opposed to a sheep carcass, it will be, you know. Uh, more affordable in, 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 in the context of the value of the carcass. Um, on, on, on state aid rules, Deputy Kenny, I mean, there is ongoing engagement at an EU level around uh, enabling the state um, to engage directly with, with enterprises that are uh, directly impacted, and that engagement is ongoing uh, at an EU level. Um, Generational renewal, I mean, I, I've made this point only as recently as in the context of ANC, I, I've made this point uh, recently, and obviously all of the taxation issues that Deputy Cahill referred to in the context of stamp duty and, and all of that, uh, stock reliefs, uh, are all uh, important. The best signal that we can send to young people uh, is to give them a, that they can see an opportunity to make a career and a, an income out of the, the, the industry of their choice. Uh, akin to what their peers can get in any other sector. And, and that's what motivates me in terms of the negotiations around the, the, the cap reform. Um, and I would be concerned that the signal we are sending in terms of a reduction in the budget, albeit uh, within that framework, you know, identified supports for generational renewal, I think the bigger picture of a signal that says Europe is cutting its budget to support the agricultural sector, farm families, and what they do in terms of producing a high quality product and delivering also what are deemed, if you leave the food side apart, public goods in the area of uh, water quality and biodiversity and all that. I think that's a really dangerous and wrong signal at a time when there's a global demand to produce by 20, 50, 70 percent additional food to meet uh, growing populations, uh, etc. Um, and, and, and an ageing profile that's, that, to be honest with you, is reaching uh, critical stages. Mm -hmm. How can we produce that food if nobody is taking up the, the, the challenge in, in the future and when there is a higher risk of land abandonment from, uh, from productive agricultural purposes, you know, increased urbanisation, desertification, all of that. So I think the incentives are important and I'm aware of that in the context of, of, of uh, the issues raised by Deputy Cal. But the most important signal we send to young people is that, look, we value uh, what they do through the common agricultural policy and we fund it accordingly. And that's why we've been very active in terms of trying to get other member states uh, to dig deeper into their financial contributions. We have signaled that we are prepared to pay more. But Europe can only spend money uh, that it's given by member states. And it has to be a unanimous decision of all member states to increase the budget. The Commission can't borrow money to spend. And I understand, you know, other member states look and see other challenges, migration and security and all that, which I've alluded to. And I acknowledge they're, they're big challenges in talking to, to colleagues, uh, you know, that's, you know, the reality for them in, in, in their uh, countries. I mean, if you're in the Mediterranean and you're seeing that challenge daily landing on your shores, migration and security are really important issues. But it, it, those challenges need new money 
and yeah. they are not a reason, as I'm sure you agree, to, to raid this, the cap budget. And that's the space we're in to try and uh, <coughs> encourage other member states to, to, to acknowledge that. It's not made easy. I mean, if you look at the outcome of the Swedish election results, for example, you now have a Eurosceptic party with the balance of power. What are the prospects of, you know, they coming into the space where they will contribute to uh, more to the common agricultural policy? When the critique from a lot of from these member states who are outliers now in terms of the endeavour to, to to contribute more to the European budget, their critique of the Commission's response was that it didn't go far enough, um, and. That's the, the, the scale of the challenge. Um, on, on, on fodder, Deputy McConlogue, um, I mean, the first thing I would really say in respect to the fodder crisis um, is the, the response of the stakeholder group was quite phenomenal. Um, and to each and every one of them and to, to all the farm organisations, there is um, a great debt of gratitude. Uh, and I think. You know, from it grew all the recommendations on, on, on all of the initiatives that we have taken. Um, but I remain firmly convinced, in fact, that the, the, the best thing that came out of it was the, the advice that was given to individual farmers, whether it was through uh, Tagusk or private consultants, or delivered via the co-ops uh, using uh, either, either or of uh, those advisors. Um, that was really important. And the signs on, um, like the audit in, in July was 28%, the audit in October, uh, early October, or, or uh, some two weeks back now or so, was uh, down to 11%. And there is a lot of endeavour out there, as you know, like fellows are, are, are bailing silage at a ferocious rate over the last week or 10 days. It's probably peaking, tapering off now. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of progress has been made, and there's uh, quite a volume of May silage to be harvested, and then we have what's coming in under the, the, the tillage initiative. So. I think you know if we get, and there's conditionality on this. If we get, and and you know if you could, if you could keep cattle out until until the start of November, and then hope that we get a normal spring, we have the bones of a solution there with all of the initiatives. Because you'll also have the, as I said, the fodder initiatives, the glass flexibilities, the uh, extension of the slurry spreading dates, uh, all of that. And I, I really think that the stakeholders have have made an enormous uh, contribution. Uh, to that. Um, I, I, I know the, the point that uh, Deputy Conlog makes about the farm uh, management sc uh, deposit scheme, and, and uh, uh, he mentioned also the, the low interest loans. Uh, and, and I mean, on, there, is a, there is a problem with cash flow on farms as well, and, and, and part of that res reason was the ask to the Commission to bring forward the payments. Um, you know, it is money that would be coming to farmers anyway, but to bring it forward at a time when cash flow is, is pinched um, is in assistance as well. And that those early payments are enabling 260 million euros of additional money to be uh, put into the rural economy. Now, we will need in the department, uh, are likely to need a supplementary estimate to enable us to to fund that um, air, higher level of, 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 of uh, payment. Uh, you know, whether, whether it was. Uh, the ANC or, or the in, well, in particular the the 85 percent advance under glass um, organics. Um, I'm having a blank moment. I think they're the two main schemes that are that are driving the as, as uh, the the, the uh, reason for the supplementary. Um, they look, the, the, I mean, in the broader context, the Agri Taxation uh, Committee. Um, that you know sat and w w was reviewed over the last number of months has delivered an enormous amount. There are some outstanding issues like the farm uh, um, deposit scheme um, that would be of great benefit to to the the, 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 the farming community. Though I, I, I suspect, to be honest about it, it is probably unlikely that there would be any great take up of it uh, in in the year ahead because of the, the challenge that's there. Not many people would have a requirement to shelter income because of costs. Uh, and it would primarily be of benefit to the dairy sector. I mean, it's not going to be an issue to the beef people that we were talking about earlier, uh, who are in numbers terms the greatest uh, number of farmers, the livestock sector. Um, and I suspect even for the tillage side, um, there may not be any great demand for it as well. But as, as a hedge, to volatility, I think it is an important, uh, outstanding issue that that, that remains uh, an ask. Um, 
on Brexit, um, I, I, like I, I, I do remain convinced that we can get a deal. Um, I, I think it's important to, to preface, like any deal we get will not be as good as the current arrangements. Um, because if you're outside the single market or the customs union, it can't be as good as what's available to us. And in that sense, we are. <coughs> it's a damage limitation exercise. Um, but, but I do remain convinced that we can get get a deal. And I think once the Tory conference is out of the way, um, you know, we will probably enter into more more uh, realistic engagement rather than megaphone diplomacy, which there's an element of going on at the moment. Um, on harness racing, um, we. We have looked at this and have given some funding earlier this year. Uh, I'll have to come back to you with the details on it, uh, Deputy McConnell. Uh, but we, we have 64,000 yeah, 64, funding we gave uh, earlier this year. That, that was an in initiative to try and tackle this issue of uh, training and, and uh, pilot projects, I think, wasn't it? Uh, to, to, to try and take some of the. Th this is a big problem on, on the roads, and Deputy Cal would be aware of some of the, the stuff done in, 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 in his own neck of the woods uh, and elsewhere. I know it's in the north side of Cork City, does a problem as well. And we have worked with the, the association and, and to try and uh, also. Um, to enable them to organise themselves better so that they may become an instrument for, for further funding in this area. But um, we have, we have uh, made some progress with them. I think, I, I, Chairman, I think I've... Before is there, I think, uh, Minister, um, I think Deputy McConnell mentioned... Oh, the, aquaculture. The, 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 the hardship scheme, a potential hardship scheme, and Deputy McConnell mentioned, and Deputy Carr mentioned pigs. Yeah, and... and, and and then the aquaculture license. Aquaculture. Yeah. Just, just on it, we, we had the aquaculture license review, and uh, to be fair, we, we have responded with some vigour uh, to that. We will, in 2018, clear 300 licences, uh, de determinations on 300 licences, and the ambition is to clear 300 more in 2019, and that will clear the backlog of licence applications. So on that issue, Minister, we'll be writing to the Queen to discuss this matter a period before you come in, and we'll be writing to you in due course, looking for a bit of more detailed okay. response in that regard. Is that all right? Okay. Um, the, and the, the other two issues were hardship and pigs. Pigs. Yeah, I, I've met with the, the pig sector in the IFA, and I've obviously met with individual uh, operators as well, and I do acknowledge that it's a very difficult uh, challenge and complicated in the, at an EU level now by uh, an extension most recently into Belgium of African swine fever, which is a, a real challenge. And, and I think the biggest imperative for the industry now is to maintain our own biosecurity in this area. That is absolutely a critical issue, and there is a high level of engagement to create an awareness around that and the, the risks associated uh, with African swine fever for us. We, I suppose as an island nation we have certain um, natural advantages in terms of biosecurity, but there is no room for, for uh, um, uh, complacency at all. Um, I appreciate from engagement that I've had as well the area of credit and uh, labour force are, are big issues for the sector, uh, as indeed obviously are prices. Uh, Borbia has a promotion, I understand, in China and, and, and Asia in particular uh, on, going on the back end of this year, and that's, that is an important uh, matter. And there's also been an issue around the level of the ceiling of, of grant aid on, on investment in pig units. Uh, and it's something that we're looking at in terms of whatever flexibilities might be there under the RDP, which are uh, uh, not evident as we speak, uh, but to see if we could uh, grant aid uh, to a higher extent uh, investment on farms. But it has to be borne in mind that that is to facilitate improved welfare circumstances on farms and thereby eliminate the use of uh, antibiotics and all of that. So it, it doesn't facilitate greater production uh, volumes, but it does make it more welfare uh, uh, friendly and more efficient, hopefully, as well. So there's no easy fix here, uh, Chairman. Um, we have engaged with SPCI as well around the, the overall issue of merchant credit and how that they might get involved in that space, generally speaking, but that's at a very early stage. Um, I mean, on a hardship scheme, I mean, there are obviously the, the state's means-tested uh, welfare schemes, but in, in the context of the, the overall uh, response by the department in the context of, of fodder, which I think is what Deputy McConnell was talking about in the area of, of a hardship scheme, I mean, we have 
I think, responded clearly to, to all of the issues that have been raised um, at the stakeholder forum. And that forum continues to meet and will be, you know, uh, important in, in continuing to, to assess where we're at and what, what in interventions are needed. On, on the further issue, before I just go back to Senator Mulhern, there's one issue that maybe I'm not sure has been addressed yet, uh, and for the first time, probably in a long, long time, we see fodder coming from west to east. Uh, I, I have been informed that it has been the first time in a long time that has happened, and there's a substantial cost involved in that as well. Would the department stroke the forum look at the idea of subsidising the cost of that? Well, I'm sure Deputy, Deputy Cal would be aware that in, in, in the throes of the, the, the late spring there was, there was further move from his neighbour's uh, county down to Tipperary um, uh, in, uh, you know, in, in April and May. Um, uh, so it's not unprecedented but unusual. Um, look, we, we consider to look at all that. I mean, the, the overwhelming objective has been and emphasis has been to close the gap and to get the tillage initiative up and running. Uh, and we remain uh, open to engage on that issue, but it's not something we've, we've uh, considered in detail at this stage. But I'm not ruling it out. Okay. Chairman, <coughs> Minister, you, you glanced over such the suckler cow uh, issue and in terms of uh, payment and particularly uh, the necessity and the possibility of doing something in the upcoming budget in relation to it. And I may just ask you to flesh out a bit further in relation to where you're at with regard to actually achieving something, working towards a €200 Euro payment per suckler cow, but at least getting the process started, Minister, because as you'll be clear, uh, there is, uh, the sector is under massive pressure, and farmers really are looking to you in this budget to give a signal to them that you understand where they're at, that you understand the income pressure that they're under, and that you're going to move to actually deliver something for them. Um, and I really do emphasise, Minister, the importance of you pushing that uh, taking, on that, uh, taking that on board, but also pushing it with the Minister for Finance and Public Expenditure to try and achieve an allocation in this budget so that, that something can be done and there can be some type of a margin delivered to suckler farmers because it's simply not sustainable that they will continue in business and not get paid for their work. I'll avoid that point. I'll ask you, Senator first of all, and I'll come back to that point then. Senator. I have a number of items, Minister, and I just welcome the opportunity to engage with you in advance of the budget. Uh, Minister, I wanted to ask for increased supports in the budget for the development of sports the sports horse industry. I think it has great potential to generate business uh, um, in rural areas uh, where we're looking for ideas to retain communities. There's already significant interest in sports. Uh, horses and it's to there's, there's plans and I believe some plans have been presented to you and uh, they'll obviously need some funds to assist and hopefully we would see um, something develop from that but that would be meaningful to local economies in uh, rural Ireland. Minister, uh, in relation to Irish rare breeds, um, Yeah. In relation to Irish rare breeds, Minister, and the need to ensure genetic diversity in accordance with our EU obligations, um, there are complaints from the Irish Rare Breed Society uh, that supports they have received from the department are minim minimal, they're not meaningful, and they're not impactful. And I'm just wondering where, you know, what, what, um, what you're looking for in this budget for them, what your view is in relation to supporting them further. Um, I suppose, Minister, um, my biggest concern here today is the suckler cow. And I know, Minister, that uh, you want to support the beef sector and uh, the suckler farmers. And I acknowledge the measures that are there, the, the beef data and genomics scheme, the establishment of the beef producer organisations, all the new markets that you have worked towards opening alongside Board BIA and all the other measures that help but, Minister, the truth is, and notwithstanding all the efforts, on the ground morale is very low with suckler cow farmers. Um, we, I suppose, in the west and northwest, where I'm located, we've had, uh, we haven't had the worst of the weather this summer. In fact, we probably had the best of the weather with a combination of sun and rain, and we don't have the fodder problem. But if we look back over the last number of years, every year we've been battling an extended winter. We've had fodder shortages, a fodder crisis last year, 
Um, we have pressures on slurry, both storage and spreading, for poor pack factory prices, poor prices at the mart. Um, we also have cash flow problems with Brexit, Mercosur, and we have climate action measures that are coming down the line to be laid upon farmers, including the threat hanging over them of a carbon tax. So I think there's evidence, Minister, uh, to give concern about the sustainability uh, of the future of uh, the suckler cow, uh, the herd. And I believe, Minister, unless there's intervention right now, that we're going to have problems in the future. Because from what I can see, and all the farmers that I have met and have been producing figures to me and telling me about their own personal situations, and I want to also acknowledge, obviously, that the farming organisations have been amplifying the situation concerning these farmers. They're making little or no money, or in fact, they're losing money. And if they didn't get other farm payments, they'd be in a, in a, a desperate situation. Um, I think this is backed up by your own uh, department's Foodwise 2015 beef group, um, where they're recommending further supports uh, for um, sucklers, and I would support this also. Minister, when I'm talking about farmers setting out their income, the sort of thing that I'm talking about is, uh, for example, a farmer showing me that it's costing him €900 Euro a year to keep his suckler cow, and yet when he sells a calf, it's €850 Euro he's getting for that calf. Now, I don't know why or how anybody would and could sustain that, and reality will bite. The reality is that farming is a vocation, but the older and more mature farmer that's there, they may stick with the vocation till the end, but your problem is the younger generation, and that's notwithstanding. I know you, you identify it as something we need to encourage younger farmers, and whether it's in relation to land mobility and that. but. I'll give you another case, Minister. I had a man come in to me. They have, it's a suckler cow farmer. They have 80 head of cattle. His son is 30 years old. He's very interested in farming. He loves farming. He bought an old house at a cost of 60,000 that he needs to do up. He went into the bank and they more or less laughed at him, told him they wouldn't get, he wouldn't get a cent based on any of his accounts. And he has a trade and he's told go back to his trade because that's the only way this man can ever hope to get a mortgage or to build any future for himself. There's no future in that suckler cow farm the way he's seeing it right now. Other farmers produce in other figures and, you know, unless they were working besides, there's no great incentive. And I feel the day um, that that will continue and because of the circumstances of younger people, younger people have had more opportunities of education, they'll walk away from this. They have better options. But that doesn't suit us and doesn't suit our country. Um, as I said, Minister, I think that, you know, if there isn't an intervention and if young people, and we all know, it's, it's, it's no secret, the average age of farmers, especially the suckler cow farmers, is quite old. If the young farmers don't take up the baton and we see the suckler cow numbers plummet, and I'm not being alarmist here, it, 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 all the facts are stacking up towards this. I know, as I said at the outset, Minister, I know you want to support this beef sector. I, I know that. But I believe that if this happens and our suckler cow herd plummets, then, you know, where I live in the West and North West will be unrecognisable. It will be unrecognisable. 81% of cows in the West are suckler cows. I think 84% in Mayo. I think when you come to Roscommon and Leitrim, it's 93%. That's a report conducted, I think, in, conjunct in conjunction, I think it's the IFA and uh, NUIC. Uh, Cork University. And you know, Minister, like what we're sacrificing here is, and this is, this is the nuts and bolts of it is, when we have our food production and we have basically have the suckler cow is the production machine for a whole vast industry. Not only are we getting the traceable quality and affordable food, we can forget about the meat factories, we can forget about the marts, we can forget about the merchants in my area, we can forget about the vets, we can forget about all the spin-off industry that is coming from the suckler cow if the figures drop in any way at the percentages that I'm giving you, Minister. And I welcome payments on the ANC that have been made and in the increase, and it's very important. But you know, there are dairy people getting that same payment. There are dairy people.
I believe at this juncture, Minister, what is needed is a targeted payment in this budget. We talk about cap and we have to be realistic and look forward and you have talked about the constraints and the challenges and I know you're fighting and alongside uh, our Commissioner Hogan and the whole, whole of government. But I think that we need a targeted uh, payment in the budget recognising the pressures that the suckler cow farmer is under which are well documented, but also the significance and the importance. This is absolutely critical where I am from. I am in absolutely no doubt about it. And we can talk about towns and villages and all the rest. The fabric, the fabric of where I'm from, rural Ireland, is the suckler cow. And it is absolutely critical that there is action to support them. And at the very least in this budget. So there's a signal is given that there is hope and that they fit into the bigger scheme. And I think anything pushed on too far down the line is going, it, this is a critical time. I think this is a pivotal time for the suckler cow farmer, Minister. And that's the message I want to deliver to you here today, Minister. I have to tell you, Minister, notwithstanding any campaigns by farm organisations, again and again and again, and it's not people fighting with me about government or anything, it's people telling me their stories of sons, daughters, whoever else, their own circumstances where they're absolutely fed up. They're fed up of it. So we need to do something and we need to act. There's an awful lot at stake here. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Thank you, Chair. I'd like to acknowledge the Minister and the Minister's statement so far regarding his opening statement and also the numerous questions that he answered in the, the previous round. I think it's a very, very large brief that has an awful lot going for it. Obviously, issues such as fodder and um, those issues were mentioned. I think I need to just touch back on a few issues regarding that. We had snow, we had storms, we had a drought in my part of the world, which is quite significant. And we have seen a significant uptake in the amount of fodder made in the last few weeks. Um, even last weekend, the amount of fodder made in my part of the world was very significant. But the knock-on effect for me and for other people that would be involved in the industry is, is the financial implications of the of the fodder, whether it was June, July and August, where large amounts of meal was being fed and round bales and whatever else. I do think the fodder crisis has moved on maybe to a financial crisis in many ways, and it's about trying to now manage that through the actual institutions itself. And I don't think the Department of Agriculture have a direct responsibility in trying to manage that funding itself. But I do think the pillar banks need to come on board and need to be more amenable to that issue. And I've heard alarming reports even this morning, and I'll share the information with the Minister after, about pillar banks being slow to deal with the actual farming community regarding that merchant credit that has built up in June, July and August that now needs to be moved off the books and maybe moved away for a two or three year loan so they can actually move through, through, that, through this phase and move on to the next phase. So that's where I think this actual fodder issue is. And I think there is an issue, Minister, and I would hope that you will engage with the pillar banks to ensure there's no blockage, that there's work that can be done to ensure that they do engage with the agricultural community regarding ensuring that that flow of funding is required itself. Um, one of the issues that happened during the summer was um, a very interesting uh, TB forum that you um, announced the new chairman of, Michael Cronin, and the figures in TB have seen dramatic decline in the last few years. They were 8% in 2000, and in 2000. I think they reduced down to 3.5% in 2017. The, B forum is something, or the TB forum is something that we need to acknowledge, and it's something that's very, very worthy. Maybe the Minister might give a clarification into how he believes that's going to work if we're going to reach our targets by 2030 to ensure that Ireland is going to be TB free, how he thinks the actual Badger uh, vaccination programme or the, the start of that programme is working, and the announcements that were in the paper today regarding the TB outlook itself and the restrictions that are going to be in herds because it's one of the issues that I've picked up on the ground today about confusion, looking for clarity, seeing where are we going to go with this actual proposal itself. I realise that it could be quite restrictive, so maybe the Minister might be able to inform us more about those issues itself. Um, as the Minister spoke quite rightly about Brexit, and so many members here spoke about the Brexit issue as well, 
I was at a meeting last night down my part of the world, and I'm not going to claim I'm a great, um, I have great knowledge of the fishing industry. But I met a group of um, individuals involved in that industry last night, and they were deeply concerned about the Brexit impact on their issue itself and on their actual industry. The UK territorial waters access that they have at the moment, if that access was limited, and the knock on effect if you had the so called EU fleet just arriving into the Irish water, having no access into the UK water. So maybe the Minister might comment on that issue because. To me, it's one of the issues that hasn't been spoken about enough, and as an industry, they feel very kind of left out of the equation itself. It seems to be about cheddar cheese instead of about the actual mackerel itself. So maybe the minister might give us a statement regarding that. And the last issue is the Foodwise 2025 policy, which is an important policy that an initiative that the government pushed out several years ago. But would the Minister give me um, his view regarding where that policy falls now under this new committee that's been set up under climate action, um, set up by um, there's an all-party um, Aractus committee with 22 members looking at the issues of climate change and where climate change fits into the actual um, how we're going to ensure we have a, a mitigation policy for climate change itself. Would you be concerned about the food, uh, the food wise policy under what's happening with those proposals itself? I realise we're going through a, a process at the moment, and the report won't be published till the 15th of January. But as the Minister of Agriculture, do you feel threatened by such a proposal? Do you feel those proposals could have a large impact, in particular on the beef industry? Some of the unfortunate. Um, Evidence given before the actual committee of late would give us the impression that we'd be better off moving out of the beef industry and maybe claiming the payments itself regarding climate. That is a very significant statement that we've seen come out of that committee in the last few weeks. So maybe the Minister of Agriculture might comment on those issues because they create a great concern as well regarding the actual industry itself. Thank you, Chairperson. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Deputy Murphy, please. Yeah, well, I've got to call you, and as you know, I'm not a member of the committee, but I was anxious to sit in on this debate today, and I do appreciate that you allow me to make a short um, contribution, and I will keep it short. And I thank the Minister for being here and, 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 and entering into this dialogue uh, with, with us people, because it is important we discuss these issues pre-budget. I know that Deputy McConnell and Deputy Cal have covered most of the issues. So when I refer to circular car and things like that, I don't expect you to go back because you've already answered it. But I do want to put it on the record. Um, Minister, the circular cow, um, all that area is so important to my part of the country, to the West, Midlands, North West. It's as important to our area as the dairy business is to the south of the country. And in reality, it cannot continue. And other speakers have said that here. It cannot continue to go on and on. And what alarms me at the moment is farmers with good land arable land are saying, you know, this isn't profitable, we can't even break even in many situations at the moment, and our only option is forestry. Now, I again want to put it on the record, I am not anti-forestry, we need it. And in terms to our carbon counts and all that, it is important. And it is a business that creates quite a lot of jobs, so I'm not anti-forestry. But you have a situation, as you know well, if I walk into the bank tomorrow morning and I want to develop my farm in forestry vis-a-vis a suckler herd, you know I will get better terms with the bank for forestry. And I think that's a pity that that happens where there's good arable land, that farmers have worked with agricultural land for years, that that land will be lost to forestry. And that has happened over and over again in my county, in my constituency, Galbraith Common, uh, since I became a TD. I've had lots of reps on that. So we do need to come to the aid of the suckler cow business. And we do need to support it in some shape or form. And as you know, our party have, for a number of years now, uh, given a commitment to 200 per sector cow. And that is vital. It's, it's, it's coming up constantly with me. But I'll leave that there because you have dealt with it. I also think, Minister, I don't know what, obviously you're not going to give us uh, any clue of what the budget is going to include. But there's a huge area, and farmers and IFA and others in briefings have told us recently, renewable energy. And I think we should really, you know, get far more serious with the farming industry in relation to renewable energy. They're prepared to work with this. There's huge opportunities there for farmers in renewable energy, and surely it's the way that we should be going, you know, going out of our way to assist farmers to become more involved in renewable energy. Um, Deputy Gall mentioned the pig sector. I think there are less now than 300 pig farmers left in this country. And I know, again, my own constituents is down to eight or 10 pig farmers. And they've had it really rough for quite a number of years. 
And I certainly wouldn't like to see a situation developing where we have zero pig farmers in this country. So they, they need some protection and they need some support. Um, and and they're people who work very, very hard. Um, the, the final thing I want to bring up with you is um, drainage, drainage scheme. I have a, prior to me going into media, I, I, I was a qualified horticulturalist and, and I have been, I suppose, involved in soil testing over a number of years. But it's very noticeable in recent years that much of our soil, uh, that the quality of the soil is deteriorated because of the, the different rain patterns. A lot of the nutrients are being washed out of our soil. So I think it's absolutely vital for the future of farming, particularly where we have heavy soils around the country and we have a lot of that type of soil, that we reintroduce a drainage scheme. Because there hasn't been one, there hasn't, well there really hasn't been a proper drainage scheme for many, many years. And that's badly needed. It's badly needed for farms. And that is something I would like to see you looking at and bringing in a budget for that, because it is vitally important. And uh, finally, if there's going to be any more money for certain forms of diversification for farmers, uh, not, I'm saying it to forestry, but other areas of maybe, you know, tourism, farming or whatever, uh, will there be money there in, in any scheme for diversification? Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Murphy. Deputy Healy Ray, I presume you want to contribute. Chairman, I'm glad of the opportunity. Um, I, I suppose I, I'll go with the way I have things listed here. I suppose the fair deal uh, minister uh, for farmers who get sick, and we welcome the three years cap, and uh, we hope that there would be money to finance this in, in, the, in the budget. But I'm very concerned, Minister, that, that the whole value of the farm, the house and all, will be assessed for, for, when determining what, what the percentage will be for the farmer to, uh, will have to pay. And it's very, it, it'll be very uh, onerous and very tough for a young farmer if his father is in, uh, in, in a nursing home or hospital or whatever. And we'll just take a, a farm valued at 500,000, and that wouldn't be a very big farm at all. So 7.5% of, of the, five, uh, the 500,000 uh, euro farm would be 37,500 a year. So even with the three-year cap, that will have a, an awful, put an awful handicap on the young farmer trying to step out. Uh, that will be over. Uh, that will be over 100,000, 339, that's, that's over 100,000. It's a fifth, more than a fifth of the value of the farm. It's going to be very tough, and I don't think that you could actually call that deal a fair deal at all. It's actually a very lousy deal for a, young, a youngster, maybe that his father uh, is taking out of the farm uh, all, of, uh, all of a sudden with a stroke or a heart attack or something, and, 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 and a, a young farmer trying to step out. I think it is very, very unfair that that will be the situation. And I mean, every other person to the family home, and, 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 and that's it, like. And, and there should be some other way of assessing the farm and the family home, because the, the family home is included in the farm as well. It's, a, it's, it's, it's very severe. It, it, it's an attack on a young fella starting out, and I, I, I don't know how they'll come from that at all. So I just want to support uh, the suckler cow, and where I come from, uh, Minister, that's all. Uh, we have back there basically is, uh, in, uh, and the further west you go, it is more sucklers and it maybe not carries is, is, is milk. Uh, sure, yeah, but uh, our side of the country um, to the suckler co and they are struggling. The Marts and Cairns Car are being, uh, Milltown, Castle Island, the both of them, McCroom, the farmers are taking an awful roasting. Don't forget your colleague. Oh yes, sure, yes. The, the Martin came here. No, the, 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 and I wasn't forgetting, forgetting them either. But farmers are taking suckler cow farmers are, are taking an awful heat at the present time. They're taking it trouncing. And you see, with the cost of feed uh, and the cost of meals and the cost of fertilizer, and I don't, I don't know how uh, the, the fertilizer companies can account for uh, the increasing the cost every year, regardless of whether the farmers are, are, have a good year or a bad year, it seems to go up regardless. And, um, 
I, I don't know, is there any way of controlling it? We, we hear this morning um, of the cost of diesel, fuel going up, uh, that the, there's talks that the government are, are, are increasing the cost of fuel, and if they're going to do that, it's going to affect the farming community in a very adverse way. I'm asking you, Minister, to, 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 when, when we're around that table, to, to, to do something to ensure that that diesel uh, doesn't go up any further, and I, I, I don't mind whether it is Minister Ross or, or, or the Green Party, or whoever is calling for this, in, 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 uh, because of, of, of climate change or whatever. The, you don't no, believe you, in that anyway. You, you must, you must I, I, I don't agree with it. No, I don't. Believe. I don't agree with it, but and, and, and I, I think it's very unfair to be increasing uh, the cost of, of that and, and, and um, carbon tax uh, when, we, when we consider that fuel is so dear at the present time coming into the country. I asked indeed uh, in, the, in the order of business that it be reduced rather than increase, uh, and, 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 and I'm not good today when I hear that the stocks have increased it rather than reduce it, because there is room for maneuver with the, when, when, when the cost has already gone up. The ear take, ear government take, ear tax take has increased as the, as the cost of the battle of oil comes in, ear tax. Year tax take has increased, so I thought there was room for manoeuvre to, to, to reduce it a bit and, and to help the people with home heating oil and, and, um, and, and all fuels. Uh, they, but I, I, I'm totally opposed to, to, to any increase in this. Areas of natural constraint, all farmers, uh, their, their, um, their payments were reduced in 2008. And um, they are right. We got 500 euros back uh, last year, uh, but we, we 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 need the rest of it, Minister. And 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 we need more with the way uh, the thing is going. Um, Keen Harrier designation uh, it maybe doesn't affect uh, uh, farmers um, or other deputies here, but it certainly affects part of my, of, of 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 Kerry and 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 North West Cork. Um, the Hinaria designation. Farmers are not being compensated for for what uh, for not being able to, to to work their land the way they would like to. They can plant it. They can do. Uh, their land is actually useless and 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 worthless. And I said it at some uh, in some forum here, uh, Minister. Uh, we hear about uh, houses being robbed and people being robbed uh, at night and, and break-ins, but this is a uh, daylight robbery, uh, uh, designating farms uh, for, for the, with these designations and not compensating the, 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 the people who own the land, the people who struggled to buy it, the people who it was handed down to, and to think that it is worthless at this stage now many farms. Are, are, are actually worthless because of your 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 your, 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 uh, your, your designation. Um, forestry. There's there's plenty places in in, in Kerry suitable for forestry, but you have a rule that that um, that you have to be 80 percent green ground in any plot that you want to plant. And I know, Minister, we're not far away from if we we'll go around any part of our outside of the country. Um, you'll see that fellows are lucky to have the 20% of green ground and 80% of all other kinds of, of ground. And I can tell you, it's not arable, Minister. And and to be suitable for, for forestry. And there was grants for all that kind of ground to plant it before. And that's where the thing has gone wrong. He, 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 he not, he not, um, he not, uh, he, 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 the rules changed and it is impeding the planting of forestry. And um, there is an, another uh, problem, and, and I know it's not of your making, Minister. Uh, there's many farmers now who want to take out their forest, and they're looking for permission, uh, planning permission from the, the forestry service, or indeed from the county councils. And there's, uh, there's what they call these uh, fellas, uh, uh, putting serial objectors, putting in serial object ob objections. Uh, to, to farmers making roadways and entrances into the places where the forestry was planted. This will militate against farmers in the future if, if, they, 
if they pay, they, they'll know now that if they plant their ground, they might not still ever be able to take the, 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 the timber out of it or sell what they, what they, what they grew. And um, it's, going to, it's going to adversely affect farmers in the future of planting uh, forestry because they, they'll be afraid they won't be able to get anything out of it. Some legislation needs to be brought forward to deal with these serial objectors and to stop this because it is actually criminal what they're doing to poor people that planted their places and, and hope to retire and have a bit of money to, 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 to help them in their old age. This is a real problem in many farms around me, Minister. I just, I just one other thing. Just, we're trying to stick to the budgetary matters. We'll, we'll, right, we'll, we'll be dealing with forestry again at a later stage in another committee. All right, but this is another matter that, that the Minister actually knows about. It's TAMS uh, grants for farmers where leasing companies, where farmers unwittingly dealt with leasing companies and and, and they're not able to, they're, they're, they're being ruled out of, of getting their grant. Something will have to be done about uh, the, the, the ones that are already applied unwittingly and dealt with the leasing companies. I know one person, he actually paid a lot of the money himself out of his own pocket and he went to the leasing company for the rest of it for a vacuum tank. He's owed 10,300 euros and he can't get it. And he's actually been robbed of his TAMS grant. And I'm asking you, Minister, at this day, here in this uh, very important committee, to do something with, for the people that, that are caught and, and, and make it clear from here on that anyone that deals with a leasing company will not get uh, their, their TANS grant because this is hurting so many people. And you know them, Minister, I know them. And something will have to be done at government level to ensure that these poor people will get their grant and, and to stop the leasing companies of, of put some impediment that they can't uh, 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 are not allowed to give uh, uh, money for where, where the farmer is trying to access a TANS grant. I am pleading with you, Minister. This is very serious and very important to many people. Who are, maybe, maybe there's not an awful lot of people, but there's an hope that something has to be done from. They're asking us. We're elected by the people. You're the Minister. I'm asking you, and I'm asking your government to do something about this issue where people have unwittingly been caught by the leasing company, by the way they access the funding from the leasing companies rather than the bank. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thanks, Deputy Healy. Uh, Deputy O'Keefe, if you want to make a contribution. Thank you, John. We try and stick to the budgetary matters if we can at all. And Very much so, if, if questions yes, have yes. been asked already, just make a brief contribution yeah. on, on those matters. Is that all right? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome, Minister. Um, uh, just a couple of points, Minister, and, and questions on um, the Thames. You know, at the last meeting I attended here, um, as well as the further crisis, you know, I, I asked the question was um, the, the take up in the Thames, the farm grants investment program, how was it going? Like, and I was told there was no problems. Yes, recently your department released figures that there's a substantial amount of applicants who are in fear of maybe not meeting the deadline of completing the work. I would ask that your department would consider the flexibility in extending those uh, farmers' time. You know, that would, would, would you confirm that, please? Like, you know, I, I know other people have mentioned, like, you know, but um, the issue like, is that uh, someone will not get their work done in time not to qualify for this round of terms that they've applied for. The other issue is, of course, the big issue, and it's been touched already, just to lend my support to the request that you do look after the, the suck to premium, like, you know, the, I don't know what time, but the, the big demands, 200 euro, but at least you get some status and we please, like, you know, um, we can see the beef industry is a bit of a crisis at the moment. And the other issue, um, to the Chair, um, I don't know if it's been touched on again, but it has been raised in, in a few circles in my area, like, um, Kind of a night threats delegation. As you know, like, you know we had a, a, a very dry summer. You had seen how many farmers took the gamble put no fertilizer, no take up. They went again and didn't finish your department, so you gave an extension time for spreading of fertilizer. And there is a scenario where some farmers may have gone over the limits of spreading nitrogen. Will you be flexible in their delegation, like, you know, to, to allow for that, you know, that, um, that because the first round of fertilizer, whatever top round, you know, well, they're taking up this. They took advantage of the goodwill that came in in September with all a few extra bags. Will you be flexible on that, like in, in the delegation application or scenario? And finally, they are looking for money, the banks to give loans, and you know, like there's a lot of farmers out there who, who can't afford to take out any more loans. 
But and I'm not going down the road of the, the meal voucher, like you know. But uh, I think the best judge of a, a farmer and, and his use of, of inputs and concentrates during the last 12 months or six months is the the merchants and the co-ops. I, I think they should be allowed. You should you should consider put a loan facility through their uh, good sales, like you know, um, because they're the people who know and have the bills to be paid. I, I think, like in terms of you know, the last time you, you did um, the, the farm loan, like you know, this, I don't think the right farmers got the loan, the la got availed of the money the last time, like you know. I, I think you, you would be in agreement there, like you know, this, the bank manager took the first customers that came in and, and, and top his list, like the best operators, like you know, and those with a good cash flow. And you're leaving some farmers at a disadvantage. But I think if you could make some kind of loan system through the co ops or the merchants, that they would carry the, the book and provide the, 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 the loan scheme to the farmer, the pay back to, eventually pay back to the, the co-ops. I think that area should be looked at because to that way we know who is badly in need and who is going to be shot or fodder and the other people who will, who will be cottoned into the area. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Deputy O'Keefe. Uh, and just a final, one final question myself, Minister, to, to wrap up the questions before I go back to you. Uh, I think we've covered every, every area at the moment. Simple question, really, I suppose. How much extra money do you hope to get this year in the budget? Sorted. Deering delivers. <laughs> um, you don't fancy coming to a meeting with Pascal later, do you? <laughs> um, Chairman, um, I'd like to thank all of the, the, the contributors for their questions, and I think, you know, obviously the beef. Uh, sector is, and, and the soccer co sector is, is um, one of the main issues that has been raised, and I think that's understandable. Uh, but it, it wasn't actually until, until Senator Mulhern and, and, and Deputy Murphy um, raised this issue um, that it, it was raised in the context of the, you know, the climate change uh, context as well. And I think, you know, very often the department is accused of, um, rightly or wrongly, of not having joined up thinking. Um, and it, I would just say that it is imperative that anything we do, budgetary or at cap level, is consistent with the, the, the um, obligations which we face under challenging um, targets uh, for reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030. And um, that's something that I'm acutely conscious of in, in the context of of um, the sector, a effectively coupled payment of 200 euros per cow, which is, um, you know, the ask. Uh, even though I've heard it described as a, as a, a targeted payment on every cow, uh, is is a coupled payment. Um, is is not the direction of travel we should go in the context of our, of our climate change obligations. Um, and I think we need to make sure that whatever we do, uh, we, we uh, are consistent with the direction of travel that we've been going on in the context of, for example, beef data and genomics, which has been about driving efficiencies in, in, in the herd, improving its genetic merit. And that's something which I'm, I'm conscious of. I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, I am in the middle of, of, of uh, the overall budget figures, Deputy and, and Chairman. and I. I, I I cannot go any further than, than that, but I, I am aware of the issues for the sector, um, as I am for, for the, the broader um, farming community. But anything that's done at any level has to be within that, that framework, because um, otherwise we would be open to, um, and rightly, to, to the charge that we weren't being consistent. And, and certainly a coupled payment is, is not the direction of travel that we should, we should uh, consider. Um, the, Senator Lumberd um, raised the issue of, um, you know, do, do I see uh, the climate change agenda as a threat to agriculture? Um, it could be. It could well be. Um, but I also think that we are starting from, a, a, you know, a position of strength in the context of the debate. There is no one issue that will resolve all this. Um, I think, you know, um, Deputy Murphy raised the issue of um, uh, 
renewable energy and all of that, and you know whether, and whether it's whether it's uh, anaerobic digestion or you know solar panels or whatever. I mean, I think we have to be open to, to all of those initiatives. I mean, whether it's milk recording or whether it's BDGP or whether it's sex semen or whether it's the use of protected urea or whether it's anaerobic digesters or the, the range of issues from sequestration to new technologies uh, to monetizing the value of waste, uh, all of these issues will, will have to be invoked to enable us to meet. And I think um, you could say that maybe uh, the, the, the last uh, CAP uh, with the exception of BDGP and GLOSS, um, didn't didn't um, drive that agenda sufficiently. Certainly, the next one will. I mean, what's on the table now is putting a far greater degree of conditionality on on um, payments in the future. But I think if you look at if you look at things like the the Smart Farm Program, which is a collaboration between the IFA and and uh, the EPA, I mean, it is showing that where farmers embrace these on-farm initiatives, they they deliver a, a, you know a good story in terms of sustainability, but they also deliver from a financial uh, perspective. They make the farms more profitable, and I think we, in a way we, we we need to work harder at demystifying all this talk about sustainability and talk about what are the practical things. I mean, for example, I mean one of the biggest challenges we face almost immediately is ammonia emissions, and simple things like moving to the to the um, the uh, trailing shoe, or, 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 or you know, other, other than the splash plate, they deliver very significant uh, improvements. As does protected urea, as opposed to can, for example. Um, so th those things that I appreciate, there is a price differential there. But it has been suggested to me, and which is worth exploring, is that if the volume of can, or if the volume of protected urea rose significantly, then the differential might dr might drop between, and, and uh, there is significant. Uh, uh, dividend from, from, from that, for example. So, we, like, there are things that we can do in bite sized uh, approaches to, to um, the, the uh, sustainability agenda. So, I, I don't think it necessarily will be, can, will be, I mean, some people have talked about it as the new quota, for example, in the dairy side. Um, and I acknowledge what's been done by the dairy industry in terms of anticipating the challenges. Um, but we will all have to do more. Uh, the department will have to lead, um, but it's right because it would be punitive not to do so financially. But the market is also saying, you know, we need to do this. That's increasingly the ask in, 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 in the markets that we want to be in, where you have consumers with, with higher spending power and they're asking about the sustainability credentials across the broader definition of sustainability, so environmental sustainability, welfare issues, uh, antimicrobial resistance, all of that stuff is kind of part of this, this agenda. And I think, like for farming generally, I think we can find a solution um, within that framework that enables us to meet those challenges, uh, those targets challenging and all as they are, but also to, to enable us to, to protect the family farm structure and a lot of that goes back to the cap and the adequate uh, budget for it. Um, the TB Forum, uh, Senator Lumberd raised, um, I mean, the challenge to the TB Forum, I suppose, is to come up with an evidence-based uh, policy recommendations to enable us to achieve the objective of meeting the target of elimination of TB by 2030. It's not... Uh, uh, it's a substantial challenge, um, and it's a substantial budgetary line in, in, in this department's uh, budget on an annual basis and increasing because of, well, as the incidence of, uh, of TB is going down, the size of the herds uh, are, are growing significantly, so the cost of a herd outbreak is more significant than it has been. And I think we all, you know, the department and, and the industry uh, and farmers and appreciate the support that farmers have put into this over the years. I, we're on the cusp of achieving this now, but I think it requires a, a final push from everybody. Um, and I, I think the forum is, 
you know, the, the, the right thing at the, at, at, at the right time, and I would hope that, that it can, uh, and I have no doubt under, under the, uh, the membership and chair uh, that's there, that, that uh, they would do um, a, a good job of work. Uh, you mentioned also, Senator Lumbert, about uh, the fishing industry. I mean, in essence, what the industry faces in the context of a calamitous Brexit is, unlike farming, uh, is that the field would be taken away from them. In essence, that's what it is, because we catch 60% of our most valuable uh, stock, mackerel, uh, in what is deemed UK territorial waters, 40% of our second most valuable stock. A third of the value of the industry in total uh, is in uh, UK waters. Um, but it, it, I mean, in a way that shows, and in a way debunks the argument that um, that the industry was shortchanged uh, in, 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 in terms of membership. That's what the industry benefited from, that it could go out and fish in other waters and, 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 and make profit. Um, so we're really clued into this issue in the context of our Brexit negotiations, and we work ad idem uh, with our side by side with the, the, the fishing industry in both catching and processing, and we have a, a position that is exactly uh, the same as theirs and are working with uh, all of the, the equally affected member states who have an exposure to catching uh, stocks in UK territorial waters and have fed that analysis into the Barnier Task Force. And it is a position that's shared by all of the POs um, in terms of our efforts uh, there. And, and, and as I said earlier, I would hope that we, we can get a, 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 pro a, a profitable uh, outcome from it. Um, ju just on, on because some people have raised the ANC issue, we did allocate 25 million additional uh, funding uh, this year. Uh, 13 million went to the mountain type land, 9 million went to the more severely handicapped, and 3 million went to the less severely handicapped. So what that meant, in fact, was uh, those uh, farming mountain type land saw their payments, which have issued to some and others as they meet the, the stocking requirement. So those with mountain type land will see their payment increase from 109 euros. Uh, 71 cents to 135 euros on the first 10 hectares, um, uh, and from 95 euros to 112 euros uh, on uh, the the uh, severely handicapped land. So, it, like, it is a significant and focused, and that's part of. Uh, I mean, Central Mulhern raised the issue of ANC and the fact of payments and the fact that you know. Uh, dairy farmers receive payments, they do. Tillage farmers don't receive payments uh, under ANC, and there are some tillage farmers in, on ANC grounds. I mean, I suppose in the broader context of that observation, the challenge in the context of the cap reforms is to focus resources where they deliver the, the greatest dividend. And, you know, obviously, you know, proposals in that regard will be awaited uh, from all of the farm organisations as to how, how that those scarce resources um, can be uh, targeted. Um, Deputy Murphy also raised the issue of the drainage scheme. I'd love to have a better answer for you, but to be honest with you, in the context of climate change, uh, the, the suggestions in some uh, quarters are about re-wetting lands rather than draining lands. We uh, don't have that problem. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, but, well, well, hardly this year. But, but, but in truth, that's the direction of travel. And uh, like in that context, the question I suppose that needs to be asked, like in terms of de that delivering public goods, um, and that's a broad term that's used yeah. for a lot of things. I mean, associated with, with the common agricultural policy, from you know um, farm families and high quality produce to the public goods of water quality and biodiversity and all that. It's to make sure that it, as, we, as, as farmers deliver those public goods that they get adequately remunerated for it. Um, but like, I suppose your question was, would there be a reintroduction of a drainage grant? I don't see that because of that's considered to be moving in the, in the opposite direction to the climate change. Uh, Sorry, Peter, can I give this Deputy Healy Ray raised the issue of the Fair Deal scheme. Um, and. As you know, Deputy, my, my colleague, uh, Deputy Jim Daly, Minister Daly, has been uh, engaged with this issue for some time, and it was a, a proposal that uh, went to government recently and was approved, so I would imagine 2019 will see uh, substantial progress on that uh, issue. Um, on Hain Harriers, and I'm aware of this issue, uh, as you'll be aware, Deputy Lee Ray and uh, I know Deputy Kinney has raised this matter previously, as, as did Deputy Cal. 
Uh, there is a 25 million euro locally led scheme uh, and payments will go out to, to those farmers that have been approved under the scheme uh, this month. And I have always said that um, that and the threat response plan, which still evades us in, in, in the area of kind of restricted access to afforestation as an option on the, that land, it is the cumulative impact of both that will, will, will deliver uh, for those farmers. But payments are commit, starting to commence uh, this month on, on, on that in Harrier scheme. Um, Rare, sorry, uh, Senator Mulhern raised the issue of, of the sport horse industry, and I think we, we all kind of, you know, were, were uh, celebrating the, the more recent successes of the, of, of the sport, Irish sport horse sector on the international stage. It, it, it does really, um, you know, achieve quite spectacularly and, and has very considerable potential there. And we have. Um, I suppose in working to a plan, we had a report uh, in the CON report some time ago, and, and we, we kind of indicated that the, the governance issues that were identified there needed to be addressed, and it, on the base of their being addressed, that the funding would follow the implementation of the report. And we most recently appointed a new board, which is significantly slimmed down and, 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 and has, I think, high quality people um, with a new chief executive appointed prior to that board um, working very well as well. So I, I think there's a, an improvement there now, and obviously uh, uh, in the context of the, the, the budgetary um, debate that's ongoing, we, we remain kind of focused on, on what we can do in that sector. Um, but I think you know th there is potential there, and we, we have infrastructure deficits here in, in that sector. Um, I, I met with some people from the sport hospital industry myself uh, down in Kilkenny um, informally last Friday evening, and, and they're hugely enthusiastic and all in, infectious uh, in many respects in terms of what they, their ambition is. And uh, you know, I, 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 Rome wasn't built in a day. I suppose they, they have a quite an extensive shopping list and research done and reports done, etc. Um, but I would like to see, you know that the trajectory would continue in the right direction for them in, in respect of funding. Um, it's never enough. Um, and, and, uh, um, but we, we do remain um, you know, supportive and, and, and working with, with the sector to try and achieve their, their ambitions. On, on the rare breeds, uh, Senator, I'm not, I'm not aware of, uh, of, of the detail of the concern, but we did increase marginally the funding available. Uh, so if you want to give me more detail... Uh, I want to, Minister. Uh, uh, we, might, we, we, might have hit your desk yet. Okay. Well, may, maybe not, but I, if, if you want to give me details afterwards, I, I'd be pleased to follow it up. It's an issue actually with our agenda. I will follow on for the coming term as well, so we can engage with you maybe going forward okay. with that. Um, I, I think I've, I, uh, sorry, Deputy O'Keefe raised the issue yeah, around TAM's, TAMS flexibility. Yes. Um, uh, in fact, he's looking for a lot of flexibility, Fla TAM's flexibility, nitrates flexibility, loans uh, via the co-ops, etc. I mean, to, to deliver a loan product, I presume, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really straying a bit out of my comfort zone here now, but first of all, there hasn't been any issue, and I have a lot of engagement with all the, the co-ops. It's the first time it has been raised with me as an option that the product would be delivered via the co-ops, and I think it'd have to probably be an approved financial intermediary. I, 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 I'm not. I, I'm not sure that that's a runner really. I, I dealt with this issue in, in some detail earlier around um, uh, the, the whole issue of access to, to, to loans. Look on on Thames. I mean. I, I, I was at. A, some of you were at a meeting last night. I, I was at a similar meeting, and I was on, on a. A, a beef farm down in County Leash and at a meeting subsequently in Port Leash last night and uh, the range of the questions that were raised here today are very similar to what's exercising the minds of the farming community generally. On TAMS, I mean, we had initially approvals that were lasting for three years and it proved uh, very difficult to, to manage the, the, the liability that the department had to provision against it and not knowing whether the farmer was going to draw down uh, or, or activate his, his uh, application or approval. So we restricted it uh, to 12 months for buildings and six months for plant, and it gives us a better chance. Um, and I think that's evidence in, in our outturns for, for this year. But I mean, in terms of people who are having kind of three-year approvals expiring, and the, the, the start of those are beginning to expire this, the, around this time now, um, I mean, they can reapply. 
Um, and I, you know, and, and, and there are tranches open all the time and being approved. We were issuing approval letters now for the most recent tranche, uh, which closed in, in, in I know, the 8th or 10th of September. So the approvals are issuing now to those applications. So there's a rolling tranche of TAMS applications. Um, and the reason why we, we restricted to 12 months was to try and get a better handle on what the contingent liabilities for the department were. And I think there's a bit of sense in that. Um, so, so I point of order to the chair. Um, well, one committee on ministry is that, you know, let's go back to when the, the last time I was here, like, is um, there is farms who have signed up for the, the Thames, right? And because of the, 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 the past six months we had, like, you know, the, the cash flow was affected in terms like, you know, and, you know, Oh, that leads them to this issue about look for an extension on the, the Thames. Like, like you're telling me now that, that, that go in and reapply again, like, jeez, you, you can't be doing that to me. Because like, secondly, they have to come in under maybe probably no specs. You know, yeah. well, in, 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 fact, in fact, they may well be beneficiaries because the spec on, on, on the, the, the costings, as, as, as I understand it, has been revised. Uh, so, in fact, there may well be beneficiary, some, some upside to, to reapplying. I mean, it's only a case of resubmitting the old application. But if there's somebody in the middle of a scheme, of, of an implementation, I mean, uh, we would have to look at that case. I don't want to make, make a commitment on the proof, but I mean, you know, I, I suppose if there's somebody who's, and for good reason this year, though, though I think, you know, doing these works out of cash flow has its own downsides, and this year was obviously a difficult year, but if there's somebody whose application is expiring and they don't intend to do it, they're entirely within their... their their rights to reapply and all the other things being equal would be approved on the basis that their previous one was approved. It's, and it's not an, a very onerous thing to resubmit the same application. And we're, we're turning the approvals every couple of months. I, I know, but you know, I the mean, guidelines it, change, don't the chairman, the guidelines change, we use Thames around, there is different guidelines, I can know. Yeah. Chairman, I just want to ask, I'm sorry now, I just, I had to go out for a quorum next door, but how long has it taken for the applications to be processed on average? I'm sorry that you may Time's applications? Yeah. Quite, I mean, the tranche is open for, two, is it two month period? They're, 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 I mean, once the deadline closes, the approvals issue um, like within a month or six weeks. Because I, I, okay, I, I may just give you details of one that's yeah. just, it, there seems to be no information going back and the application seems to be in a black hole. So. Yeah, the minister at, at Sorry, Look, I mean, well, one sec, one second, let, let, let's, let's be clear about the nitrates. We went to a, a very considerable effort to try and renegotiate the rule for nitrates to And I think that was an achievement in itself in comparison with the challenges that other member states met. So, I mean, I don't think it's, it's reasonable to expect that we would waive um, the terms and conditions of it. Just in relation to the terms and the leasing companies. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, Deputy Ray, on, on that issue, I mean, I'm aware of the point, we've discussed this before, and you're not alone. Um, it, if there was an easy solution to this, Deputy, we would have done long ago. I mean, under the terms of the scheme, under the terms of the scheme, uh, the circumstances that you outlined are specifically prohibited under the terms of the scheme, and they were always the terms of the scheme. They didn't change. Um, what I think, the leasing companies, to my mind, did know what they were doing, and they, as such, they cut the farm. And there should be some way of, of bringing these people to task, because uh, that's my, the farmers didn't know. The farmers didn't know when they were getting the money from the leasing company, but I'm full sure that the leasing companies did. I mean, look, I mean, there is another, like, the, um, leasing is, uh, particularly for a lot of contractors and stuff, it's a legitimate part of their business. They, they are constantly on leases. Uh, you know, I, like I know what you were talking about, it was a specific uh, item that's approved under Thames, uh, but I don't want to to dump on leasing companies entirely other because they are a legitimate part of the infrastructure around contracting in particular, etc. Yeah, well, can you brief it? Yeah, just a couple of points following on from some of the comments you made there. In, in regard to the, the um, and I appreciate a suckler scheme becomes a coupled scheme, 
I mean, appreciate that's something that you, don't, you don't want to go down. I, I, I understand that in a sense. But I wonder, in, is there is there a, a way of doing that which would be more like a welfare scheme for the Wienland calf where certain actions could be put in place and where you could have around husbandry and around welfare and management, etc., where you could have a scheme which would be about the calf rather than about the cow and would, be a, would have actions built into it which would get us over that? Is, is, there, is there a possibility of doing it? Because I think we have to think, think outside the box and hope for a solution for that sector. And I, I, you know, in, in, in regards open, to the budget... I'm open to all thinking outside. The well, that's thing. what we need to be doing. Uh, also, in regard to then, we're here about the budget. In regard to the budget, will there be something in place to cover the, the young farmer entering the, the the industry? Because that's that's one of the issues we need to see. You and know. we don't want any more forgotten farmers. We already have a bunch of them, and we don't want to see any more of them being put into that category. And thirdly, uh, the issue was raised about the because I, I don't want to delay the meeting. Thirdly, the issue was raised about the, har the harness racers, and the harness racers, I understand, did get a piece of money, and the piece of money was used for to do a report into the industry moving forward and they've done that report and they've presented it and they've also put forward a budget request as to how they need to get themselves established over the next period of time. I think altogether it comes into about a million euro per annum. Now in the context of the overall, is it 65 million I think, that between Horse Race in Ireland and, and the, the Board of Gone and all get, if there was some way of finding money there for to support that sector, I think it would be, it would be appropriate. And finally, uh, I, I wasn't here when, when Deputy Murphy raised the issue of drainage. I think drainage is an issue where appropriate. I think the appropriateness is what we have to come into here. Because certainly where there's heavier land, we find, and, and the issue of fodder comes into this, you can get a longer grazing season, you can get more land into meadow, but in, unfortunately in many parts of the country, and certainly in the west and in, in, in areas where you have heavier soil, the problem is that the land is too wet for to be able to do that. And if we had a drainage scheme in place, it would open up possibilities there, where appropriate, and I understand it's not appropriate everywhere, but where appropriate, and I think common sense has to be applied, but I think there is need for a drainage scheme of that nature in appropriate places where it would work, and where it would assist farmers to be able to increase their productivity. Uh, uh, it's sub subject to correction, and I am aware that I've ha I have a request at my desk to make contact with somebody from the harnessing side, um, but my, my understanding is we haven't received the strategic plan, but I'm subject to correction on that, but I, I, I don't believe I have received it yet. We did provide some funding to, to enable the organisation to to present a strategic plan themselves for the sector. Uh, and, I understand and, it was presented in the last few days. Yeah. To, and also to do some, some work on, on welfare-related stuff, which... which regularly hits the, the airways in a very negative way. Um, so um, I, I, I uh, as I said, subject to, to, to correction now, I, 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 uh, I don't think I've received the, the strategic plan yet. Um, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm open to all sorts of thinking outside the box, but I, I you appreciate that there are budgetary stuff ongoing, so I can't say a whole lot more on that, Jim. Okay. All right. Okay, Minister and officials, thank you very much for coming forward to me today. We we'll look forward to next week with anticipation. Um, and thank you, as I said, thank you for coming forward to me today. As there is no further business, the meeting stands adjourned until Tuesday, the 16th of October at 3:30 p.m. Thank you very much.